Well, welcome to History Quest. My name is Brian. I'm the executive director of the McLeod County Historical Society. This is Bailey, the director of the McLeod County Historic Partnership. And this is Daniel Avery Cross, also known as Larry Mocked. He is one of our co-hosts on the rebranded show, History Quest. You may have watched the show before. It was called Spotlight on the Collection. But since I've taken over as executive director, I've been looking to change a few things up and add something that we haven't really done before, so I hope you all enjoy it. This week, we're talking about John Otherday and the lost town of Cedar City and how it all works in with the Dakota conflict of 1862. It was going to be a daunting task. In front of him lay the tall grass prairie that spread over 150 miles of gently rolling hills in the Minnesota countryside. It was land that he was familiar with, land that he knew well, yet the prairie had turned red with blood. Alone he would have no problem passing through. His reputation in the North Country preceded him. Yet it wasn't his own well-being that concerned him. Rather, it was the 62 men, women, and children whose survival would depend on the cunningness of John Otherday. His birth name was Anpetu Tokeka. He was born in 1801 in Nicolette County. To his people he was known as Good Sounding Voice. His pleasant sounding name was a contradiction to his very existence. Strong, fearless, and possessing handsome features, he was known far and wide as the fiercest warrior the Dakota had to offer. In a fight with another famous Dakota man, Good Sounding Voice bested his opponent by biting off a chunk of his nose. His opponent was thereafter known simply as Cut Nose. In 1858, Good Sounding Voice was among a delegation of Dakota leaders who went to Washington, D.C. He was told to abstain from drinking while on the trip, but ignored the warning. While the other Dakota leaders were on a diplomatic mission, and Petu Tokeka seemed to be on vacation, According to one translator, he signalized himself in debauchery, going so far as to visit a house of ill repute where he met a saloon girl, married her, and brought her back to Minnesota. Shortly after returning, however, good sounding voice began a journey of self-alteration. He quit drinking, converted to Christianity, and enrolled in a government-funded agricultural program aimed to turn the Sioux into farmers. For enrolling in the program, he and his wife were given farm equipment, livestock, and even a frame home to live in. With his new life, he was also given a new name. Good sounding voice became known to whites and Indians alike as John Otherday. While John Otherday had a newfound respect among white settlers, some of his own looked on him with disdain. In 1862, seeking retribution for the poor treatment they suffered by the hands of the United States government, a large force of Metawakanton, Dakota, under the leadership of Little Crow, attacked the white settlers living on the Lower Sioux Reservation. Otherday raced to a council being held at the Upper Sioux Agency. He was ardently against the war on the white settlers, stating many of them were innocent and friendly towards the Sioux, and that a war would end in absolute destruction of their people by the white soldiers who greatly outnumbered them and who were sure to come. Many in the council spoke against Other Day. Little Crow himself admonished him as a traitor and a coward. His argument failing, John Other Day left the council and headed home. He took his rifle, his wife, and went to warn his white neighbors of the impending danger that was soon to be on their doorstep. 62 white men, women, and children followed Other Day to a stone warehouse where they could take refuge and fight off any Dakota warriors that dared attack. Under Other Day's protection, the refugees found safety. Though many of his own saw him as a traitor, he still commanded respect among the Dakota. While the war parties went out to set fire on farmsteads and towns nearby, Other Day and his group of refugees stayed unmolested. On the evening of August 19th, they made a decision to leave the warehouse. For three days, Other Day and the ragtag group of settlers traveled across the prairie toward northern McLeod County. Most of them were women and children, some without shoes. They had little food, few clothes, and little ammunition. Many of the rifles were loaded with nothing more than pebbles. During the day, they trekked through the countryside in fear of an attack. 
At night they camped in the open, and according to some, John other days stood guard the entire time. On August 22nd, the party found themselves near Cedar City, a long lost town that stood northwest of Hutchinson. A number of the refugees took shelter there. Others went on to the Hutchinson stockade. John Otherday was seen as a hero for his efforts. In St. Paul, a number of white settlers pooled their money together and gave him a reward of $45, a large sum for settlers at the time. The government decided to give him an award of $10,000. But while passing through Congress, it was amended and whittled down, and instead they gave him $2,500. After the war was over, the Dakota were forcibly removed from the state. John Otherday, however, was allowed to stay. With his reward money, he bought a new farm, but his lack of experience with crops drove him to poverty. And in 1869, John Otherday died of tuberculosis. Today, while we contemplate the events of the Dakota conflict, and while we look at who to villainize, it's all too easy to forget about those like John Otherday and the many like him who have gone unrecognized in history. He was a true hero in a time and a region where heroes sometimes seemed few. So let's open it up for discussion. I've lived in McLeod County for 30 some years and mm -hmm. so I've never heard, I've, I know about the 1862 Indian Uprising but I, and I had heard that there were some uh, Indians that were uh, uh, against the war and the uprising and that but I never had a name to put to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm very excited to, and I'm learning uh, about this as we go along, so I'm very excited to, about taking part in this. So. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that um, it wasn't the entire Dakota nation that was fighting the whites. It was actually just a small portion of them. Um, most of your Dakota were against the war. They were friendly with the whites. They were neighbors, you know, for mm -hmm. decades. These people lived side by side. The whites depended on the Dakotas when they got here because the Dakotas were the ones who had laid all the trails down, which became your roads. They were the ones who basically were populating areas that would later become towns. Our, our foundation was built on their foundation, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, so the whites really depended a lot on them. And then as things started getting bad on the reservation, you know, as they started running out of food and running out of money, they were depending on a lot of the white settlers just on being friends, on the helping hand for a meal or for water or for just mm -hmm. whatever kind of help. And so most of your Dakota were very against the war and John Otherday was one of them. And even Little Crow himself, the, the leader of the war, was against it is just in many ways he was pretty much forced into leading his his warriors in the fight. Mm -hmm. Something I've noticed when this topic gets brought up as I, as I work more in local history is that people don't know what to call it. Like oh, yeah. depending on yeah. when they were in school, was yeah. it the Dakota mm -hmm. Uprising? Was mm -hmm. it the Dakota Conflict? Is it the Dakota War? And it doesn't get brought up in schools. I think in middle school, students learn about it and then it never gets talked about again. Even when I was in college, getting a history degree, m local history was not brought up very often because there's, there's so many topics to cover. But this is, this is so unique to the state and every county has their own story about how their citizens were involved with this war. <laughs> I, I like the point you brought on, you know, nobody knows what to call it. Mm -hmm. um, there's the, when I was in school, we were taught that it was the Sioux Uprising. And you still, I still find myself calling it the Sioux Uprising a lot. The more politically correct term now is Dakota Conflict or U.S. Dakota War of 1862. Um, at times, I'll use the term Dakota Conflict or Dakota War and I'll get this funny look like people think that North or South Dakota invaded Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> so so I think in context, I think using that term Sioux Uprising is okay, but it, it's more about just, you know, realizing that there was two sides to this fight. It wasn't, it wasn't just your classic 1950s John Wayne group of Indians mm -hmm. who are savages and bloodthirsty. There's a reason why they did this and there's a very good reason why they did this. And then mm -hmm. on the flip side, there's a reason why they were pushed out of the state. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, it was a very, very bloody, very 
two-sided conflict and there's nothing black and white about it at all. But McLeod, the first town in McLeod County was Glencoe in 1855 and Hutchinson was in that same year. And so many other of the seven towns took longer to get established, like I learned. Um, Stewart wasn't officially incorporated until 1888 because of how the Dakota War and people having to flee the settlement affected the, the growth of these communities. Yeah, it, it played a big part in, in our history, not just mm -hmm. as you know a, a county, but as a state and even, even as the nation. Um, it was because of the Dakota conflict, really in a lot of ways, set in motion the uh, Plains Indian Wars of the 1870s, you know, and, and really that didn't end until Wounded Knee. And the Custer's uh, battle in 1876 uh, was a result of this mm -hmm. uh, conflict. Yeah, and absolutely. And uh, kind of an interesting sidelight, uh, my uh, great great grandfather took part in the, uh, uh, when Colonel Sibley came out to uh, rid the state of the uh, uh, Dakota Indians. Uh, my uh, great-great-grandfather was part of the first Minnesota Mounted Rangers mm -hmm. that um, uh, forced them into the Dakota Territory. I think a, a lot of these little settlements had just some form of, you know, some form of protection mm -hmm. that, that the, the townspeople just built on their own. Yeah. You know, and so, so a lot of them were sod forts or a barricade of wagons and tables tipped over that they could hide behind, which is mm -hmm. essentially what they did in New Ulm. Mm -hmm. um, not every town was like Hutch, where they actually built a stockade that, you know, you could just envision the soldiers from F Troop running around and, you know. Um, but even, even Glencoe, I, I believe they had a stockade too, because we have a. Was it Fort Skedaddle? I had yes. Fort Skedaddle. Yeah. Yes. They just, they just, I don't. That's I'm that's. Not quite sure. I Speaking think, of F Troop. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I think Fort Skedaddle has is the name that it's been given. There's nothing that says in that 1860 time period that's the name of it. That was the name of it. I'm sure but it wasn't an official fort in that. It was no. just uh, townspeople mm -hmm. putting up in the battle. Well, my hometown was. Um, it was basically just, just like all these other towns, you know, they, they built a little sod fort. It was, they heard the news and people started coming in and they said, hey, how are we going to house these people? You know, if we have 80 refugees rolling in, we need to house them and we need to feed them. And so they built this little sod fort and they sent out a relief party to to save other people. Um, but it, it always made me think, not just this fort, but any of these forts, you know, these people were staying in there for about a month. So what were the conditions inside these forts? Because people were bringing livestock with them. Um, it's not like there was a shower in the corner of the officer's quarters or anything like that. You know, it, it had to be fairly atrocious. <laughs> but it's definitely, like I said, it's a very, it's an interesting part of history. And I, the thing that gets overlooked, I think now, um, aside from the events themselves, is that this all happened right in our backyards. I mean, this is Literally. this is a story that is worthy of a Last of the Mohicans epic movie. And if you live in Minnesota, this happened right in your backyard. And there's history everywhere about it. There are little sites um, just around here. We have many Dakota Uprising or Dakota War sites. Uh, we have the site of Little Crow, where he was shot. Mm -hmm. And we have, you know, the site of the stockade where he was brought into town, you know, where the body was brought into town. So it's a, it's a very, very historic event and it's just, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And people were being killed on the streets of what is now streets of Hutchinson, but back then it was out in the country, uh, uh, well, you know, by, across the, by the whole territory that was over happening. Over by 3M, I think there's a monument that shows where some people were killed. And, and it was, it, it was very brutal in the way that during the first couple of days, the, uh, the white settlers were caught completely by surprise because they were on such good terms with the Dakota. Um, but these were rogue Dakota. They, yes. they were, yes, they were. Um, some of them, though, were, were not. Some of them had been friends. There's a lot of stories where 
where a band will come up to the cabin, the house, the homestead, and they're recognized for being in that settlement many times, whether it was to trade or whether they're just passing through hunting. And it would go so far as they would be invited into the house and they would kill the family. And it was, uh, I, I think, you know, really what, what gets overlooked here is how bad it must have been for these people to turn on their friends how bad their situation is. You know, when we talk about how brutal it got and how vicious some of the fighting got, um, it, it, there's a tendency to look at it and say that, you know, this, these people weren't justified in what they did. And, and, and for some of them, for some of the events that happened, no, there was no justification for what they did. But you have to look at it as how bad the situation must have been on the reservation to get these people to turn on their friends, to resent their friends so much mm -hmm. that they were willing to turn on them. So it was a crazy time. I think were, people were starving. They weren't getting their, uh, their payments from the, right. the um, U.S. government because of the Civil War and, and uh, a lot of the young people were off to the Civil War and, mm -hmm. and uh, young men. I think Little Crow said it the best himself. Um, prior to the war, he was lobbying to get food for his people because the payment hadn't come and the uh, trade merchants had cut off credit to uh, all of the Dakota and people had already been dying of starvation. They were eating what little they could find. They were eating their dogs, they were eating their horses, um, they were eating shriveled roots. Um, in desperation, they were eating raw ears of corn that weren't fully developed yet. I mean, they, they were literally starving to every sense of the word. And Little Crow said it best when he was trying to get this, get the food and get the traders to extend the credit and open up their warehouse doors. He said, sometimes when people are hungry, they take what they want. And that's exactly what happens. So. All right, let's go on a history quest. Here we are at the approximate site of the Cedar City Settlement, the place that John Otherday brought his refugees, or a portion of his refugees, during the Dakota Conflict in 1862. Today it's owned by the Twin Point Gun Club. Um, they've got a little cabin here, they, it's, it's just a beautiful spot and they were nice enough to let us come out and film some of our episode here. Little is known about Cedar City. It was located in the northwest corner of Acoma Township, a small settlement built on Cedar Lake. There are no pictures, drawings, or known descriptions of the town. For all that we know about McLeod County and the lost towns that reside within it, Cedar City remains a mystery. What is known, however, was that its first settler, Daniel Avery Cross, arrived to the site in a covered wagon during the fall of 1857, a time that many historians refer to as Minnesota's land fever era. Cross built a cabin and moved his family to the site where his daughter, Mary, was reportedly the first white child to be born in all of McLeod County. In 1862, Cedar City became a small gathering point for refugees across the region, some of which traveled from the Sioux Reservation with John Otherday. Later in the fall of that year, Daniel Avery Cross went on a scouting mission where he was killed by Dakota Indians. His story, much akin to the town he founded, is now all but lost to history. But this is the place where Daniel Avery Cross had his settlement here and where he lived and where the first white child was born in McLeod County. There, there he is. So. All right, well, we thank you again for enjoying this month's episode of History Quest. I just wanted to say one thing. Um, down at the museum, we have our pork chop feed coming up on June 11th, Monday, and it's an event to kick off the water carnival. We have some exciting entertainment coming. We have a folk singer from the Metro. His name is Dury, and he's going to be coming and playing music for us. We're also moving the event outside this year, and we're going to put it by the log cabin in the back, and we're kind of going to create 
create this um, like backyard barbecue sort of feel. So weather permitting, that's the plan. If it rains, we're just gonna move inside. So make sure you come down for that. You can just pay right at the door. It's $12 for a plate and it's $3 for an additional plate and $6 for, for kids. So, and then we also, the week before on Sunday, June 3rd, have Dean Erdahl coming down to the museum. He'll be there at 2 p.m. and he will be talking about Minnesota regiments in the Western theater of the Civil War. I know he's got a good following in the area and he's, he's semi-local, so uh, really, you know, take advantage of that and come out and see us. So, well, that's all we have for this week, so stay tuned and we'll see you again.